In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. I'm so glad to be with you here today. We've got a very fascinating topic uh, in Christian theology to think about. We're going to be talking about salvation and the different ideas behind uh, how one is saved. And uh, to help us think through these issues, joining me on today's show, Dr. Matthew Bates, who is the Assistant Professor of Theology at Quincy University. Uh, Matthew, thanks for joining me on the show today. Thanks, Kurt. It's wonderful to be with you. So um, there's this book that you've written, Salvation by Allegiance Alone, and uh, I'm familiar with it, and I, I've been able to check it out a little bit, and uh, you've, uh, I, I see that you've gotten some flack from some people that I, that I think misunderstand you, um, but essentially you're saying that we've really misunderstood faith, and that uh, one is not saved by, if I can say this, uh, faith alone, that there's more to it than that, there's more that it entails. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, the the book before we sort of get more into the, the nitty-gritty, if you will. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it, it is fair to say that um, I am arguing that we're not saved by faith alone. Uh, that is, if we understand faith uh, in the way that it's popularly understood today. Mm. Uh, and that's part of the, uh, the discourse of the book, right, is to parse some of that out. And um, I would want to affirm, on the other hand, that uh, we are saved by pistis alone, uh, if we want to understand the word pistis, uh, mm. which is the Greek word behind faith. Um, and uh, if we have a proper understanding of all the shades of meaning that pistis would entail, I would still want to contend that we are saved by pistis alone. Um, yeah. That's traditionally translated faith. Um, but part of the point of the book is that um, uh, that those translations are limited and that um, there's a limited range of English language ideas that have come to be associated with faith in our contemporary culture. Um, but uh, the word pistis is a little bit bigger, richer word, mm. uh, and that we need to recover some of those dimensions of pistis. In particular, then, one of the things I'm arguing is that uh, a neglected dimension of pistis is loyalty. Um, and uh, that the word pistis in Greek in its ancient context and its Latin equivalent fides uh, involved notions of loyalty, embodied loyalty, mm. uh, that we need to recover mm-hmm. when we're thinking about faith. So for you then, it's not so much, um, the beef isn't so much with the word faith itself, but it's how in our context today, the word faith means say X, Y, and Z, and for what you understand that ancient word, which is translated faith, that means X, Y, and Z, but also A, B, C. Is that a good way of looking at it? Yeah, that's a pretty good way of looking at it. Um, So I do think that maybe our English language usage of faith, though, and of especially as that's been associated with belief, has has moved along a trajectory in our current English language culture uh, that makes it hard to recover that word anymore. I don't. I think it may it may be best for us to abandon ship mm. uh, and to and to choose a different word. So oh, okay. yes, I think you're right. I mean, if we were really careful in terms of how we were going to define faith, and we were to make sure it doesn't just mean X Y Z, you know, but also you know X Y Z and A B C, yeah, uh, then we could potentially recover it. But I I think we've, we're fighting a tremendous uphill battle, and there are better words available for us at this point. Okay, so help me understand a little bit here with the contemporary usage of faith. What, what do you take it that it means, and what do you think are some of the problems with the contemporary usage? Okay, yeah, and maybe it's better, uh, best in this situation to start with what I think that faith isn't, as I think that yes. <laughs> um, there's a lot of misunderstandings around that. And one of the things I would argue is that it's not the opposite of evidence assessment. Um, and mm. um, sometimes it's thought that like we have faith on the one hand and we have evidence on the other, uh, and that what God really wants from us somehow is to, <laughs> yeah, is to just believe despite what the evidence might. Yeah, say. just willy nilly. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, just willy nilly. Just you know, God says things, and if God says them, we should just believe them willy nilly, uh, without uh, really thinking about um, what what kind of structure is behind that. 
Um, yeah, so trying to, to work on that and to, to realize that uh, the kind of faith God's calling us to, if he's calling us to faith, it isn't um, the opposite of uh, assessing the evidence. Um, mm. So, yeah, typically that's been called um, fideism, uh, is right. sort of the philosophical name for that, uh, you know, that problematic view of faith. But nevertheless, it's got a grip, it seems like, in popular culture, right, mm. as uh, many people understand faith that way. Yeah, well, and especially for— uh Listeners here, the podcast, you know, we've got a number of episodes on uh, apologetic topics. And so people that are listening definitely experience that where either, um, you know, they, they know someone or uh, they personally uh, have experienced people saying, uh, like m- myself, I grew up in, you know, uh, you'd often hear you, especially a youth pastor. For some reason, it's youth pastors. Uh, it's saying, well, you just got to have faith. You know, if, if the question's brought to the youth pastor and they don't know how to answer it, oh, you just got to have faith. Well, mm-hmm. that doesn't seem too too pleasing to people. Uh, and so the, their, their deep questions and meaningful and important questions go left unanswered. And sadly, it can be a stumbling block for them as they uh, mature. Um, and so you're right, that term faith, uh, does sort of have this shortcoming. Um, so for you, though, there's something more to it. There's lo- loyalty is a big aspect to pistis, that Greek word. Tell me more about yeah. that. Yeah, well, the, the Greek word pistis then, yeah, involves um, ideas of trustworthiness, of loyalty, of faithfulness, of fidelity, um, we might tend to think about it more in the cognitive realm, like that faith is belief or something like that. And we might even reduce it down to intellectual assent. Mm. Uh, or we might try to, you know, kind of move in Kierkegaard's direction of a leap in the dark, you know, and just sort of think that that's what God wants, is that us to just sort of take a leap at him in the dark. Um, but that that uh, those kinds of ideas, right, um, obscure um, the proper meaning of pistis, which includes a bigger range. Um, t- the technical term for this would be it's sort of its semantic domain mm. you know, that scholars would use to talk about pistis. But it's probably about um, some, somewhere around 20 percent of the time the word occurrences in the New Testament of pistis actually can't be translated faith or belief. They have to be translated faithfulness. Oh, um, huh. And they are. Uh, so it's it's uh, this would be something that's typical in English language translations. The translators are making choice mm. uh, choices when they translate, and yes, they, that's they true. translate faithfulness um, quite freely with regard to pistis in certain kinds of contexts. Mm. So um, my question is that why in other kinds of contexts, right, are we excluding the loyalty notion uh, that is connected to pistis? Is it because of our anxieties around faith and works, especially um, those of us who are Protestant? Mm. Yeah, that's. Um for me, one of the ways I haven't had a uh, a stereotypical Christian uh, walk with the Lord. Um, I never saw myself as buddy buddy with Jesus as other people did, or at least in terms of how they communicated that experience. And for me, one of the ways that I would communicate my experience is that uh, Jesus is the King, and so. Uh, when you think of one's relationship as a, a king to, you know, say a servant, um, uh, there are ideas there that are not present in other relational aspects. So when I came across your proposal here, uh, it was immediately, uh, it immediately resonated with my uh, religious experience that because I view Jesus as king, these notions that you're talking about, loyalty, trustworthiness, they're already there. And so, you know, I don't have, say, some of the doubts that people have when uh, they communicate their religious experience uh, in another way. So this is all to say, I think there are some some great uh, applications to come forth from your proposal. But um, tell me a little bit about how it is um, that we should see uh, Jesus as a, a king as he's uh, proclaiming the gospel? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, and really, if you, if you think about the kind of positive proposal my book is making, on the one hand, it is that faith um, in certain contexts means something more like loyalty or allegiance. Um, the other part, uh, really, and, and a lot of the evidential structure for that comes from a reassessment of the gospel. You know, we think we know the gospel is that something so basic, um, yeah, yeah. and we have gospel-centered churches and gospel-centered this and that, right? 
Um, but uh, whenever we get real precise about the gospel or you ask someone to very precisely articulate it, um, you'll often get something quite different from what the Bible says whenever it defines the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so um, we get definitions of that in a couple places that are more precise. Um, we do have some in Paul's letters, um, and then also um, we have Jesus' own proclamation of the gospel. Um, and both of those are resources that we can look at. And then begin that. beyond that, we have the early apostolic preaching. Um, so at the heart of my proposal, then, is the idea that the gospel in, uh, includes the idea of Jesus's kingship, that mm. I think that Christians have been very ready to see that Jesus is the Lord and Jesus is the king. And uh, this is something so obvious from within the bounds of the, the New Testament. There's very few who would resist that idea. Right. Um, but on the other hand, that's usually been viewed as extrinsic to the gospel. It's not something that's intrinsic to it. Yeah, you so don't see people like, working those thoughts out into application. Yeah, or even or even as part of an evangelistic um, a necessity, as people articulate mm. the gospel, it te- it tends to be a Romans Road approach, or historically has been. Yeah. You know that we need to you know believe that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and this includes you. Right. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. in, in light of this, then you, what you really need to do is you need to believe that Jesus has died for your sins and that's sufficient for you and that you can trust in nothing else other than Jesus's sufficiency. Mm-hmm. And then if you've believed that, uh, and you're you set to go. Your heart, yeah, you're <laughs> set to go. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, but that's the Romans Road Gospel, and you notice what it doesn't include is the idea of Jesus as Lord. That might get tacked on at the end. There might be kind of like believe that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Yeah. Uh, but then it's it's there's confusion over what to do with it because most of the time the believe part has gotten reduced down to a cognitive sort of idea of believe with your head. Mm-hmm. Uh, people might say you need to confess that Jesus is Lord um, and and have some notion of a commitment to Him, but it's not really viewed as actually really important or foundational to the gospel. Um, and what, a lot of the energy of my book and a lot of the effort in my book is to help people to see that it's not just uh, important to the gospel. It's, in fact, the climax of the gospel, mm. that we don't want to we don't want to uh, neglect the atonement and say that it's not important. But actually, if you look at the articulations of the gospel very carefully in the New Testament, the climactic moment in terms of the gospel presentation is the idea that Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God, the father and has become the king. Mm. And he's now beginning to rule. And in light of that. Uh, then we are to respond to him with pistis, uh, which uh, I would understand then to be not just a cognitive ascent or a, con- a confession in some sort of way, um, mm-hmm. uh, a big way, but a very kind of specific acknowledgement of his uh, of his uh, kingship and a loyalty to him. Right. We're no yeah. Um, so perhaps you can um, enlighten us a little bit. I know sometimes uh, preachers, pastors will use this language, and uh, you know it's it's in our creeds as well to be seated at the right hand of, of God, the Father Almighty. What does that mean exactly for one to be seated at the right hand? Yeah. Um, well, the dominant, you know, um, language from this is borrowed from Psalm 110, you know, which is um, uh, this this uh, a very powerful psalm, you know, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Um, and so as scholars have tried to get um, a handle on the meaning of this. They've looked at actually ancient thrones and things like that to see like what what metaphor might be uh, involved there as the psalmists were speaking about this. And um, actually, um, royal thrones in uh, the ancient Near Eastern world involved more of a bench uh, where you might just you have the king sitting in the center, but um, uh, but then at the same time, you know, you might have a right hand man or things like that, mm. you know, that would actually share in the royal throne. Uh, and so the idea of um, sitting down at the right hand of God would be sort of uh, keeping the idea of God himself, God the Father, as being the great king of all kings, but then Jesus being installed as the, the king of all kings alongside of him and sharing in his royal rule in some way, participating in it. Mm. Um, and so that we would want to see this as a, both a statement of Jesus's participation in God's unique prerogatives, uh, but also uh, the station of power from which that uh, the kingly authority is exercised. Yeah. So that he's acting as the vice regent and ruling over uh, all that uh, is placed in his hands. Yeah. Um, and so we would understand him to be the king of both heaven and earth. So even, um, and I don't want to go too far down this line, but it seems that as we reflect more upon how it is that Jesus is king and the authority he has, there are Trinitarian issues that find themselves in. How is it, you know, Jesus relates to the Father and uh, those sorts of questions. So, it def- yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that, um, yeah, an important um, thing to think through in the framing of the gospel itself is even the Trinitarian dimensions of it, as as if, if we kind of reduce the gospel down to some sort of for, forgiveness transaction, mm-hmm. uh, and that what God really wants from us is to believe in the atonement or to believe in Jesus's all-sufficiency, however we want to define that, yeah. believe that it's his righteousness, not ours, or however it gets reduced down— um, it tends to it tends to um, to neglect the Trinitarian dimension. Mm. Uh, the full gospel involves the incarnation, which involves the idea of the Father sending the Son, mm. right, to take on human flesh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's a story about Jesus. You know that Jesus uh, was incarnated into the Davidic line. You know, and that he came into human existence. He already existed, but came into human existence through the Virgin Mary. Uh, and then, uh, uh, as part of his human life, then uh, he was a teacher, and then. He dies for our sins. He's buried. He's raised on the third day, mm. uh, and uh, and all this in accordance with the scripture, right? You know, and then he, he uh, is seen by many witnesses, and then ascends to the right hand uh, of God the Father. And that's where I say the climactic energy really centers. And then he'll return again as judge. But the idea of him, especially being seated at the right hand, if we inspect what is, what does he do there? Um, the first thing he does is pours out the Spirit, mm. right? And so uh, when we want to think about the trinitarian dimensions of that then as we think about the full gospel is that the father sends the son, you know, um, on his incarnational mission so that the son, as he reascends to the father, then can send the spirit. Mm. Does that get into issues of the, um, uh, the, the issues pertaining to the great schism over how, uh, how the spirit, uh, comes forth uh, from the Father and of the Son? <laughs> the- yes, it can. Um, <laughs> certainly, yeah, you, you might find, uh, those who would be um, wanting to make sure the the proper ordering is preserved there. Right, right. Uh, and and, uh, and yeah, this is the filioque clause is, yes. is what's being referred to here as yes. um, famously in church history, there was a, a, a point of tension between the Eastern Orthodox Church mm-hmm. uh, and the Western Church that emerged over the addition of a clause to the Nicene Creed uh, that involved the language and the Son, uh, mm-hmm. that the Spirit was sent not just from the Father, but the Father and the Son. Right. And that was added by the Western Church without the full approval of the Eastern Church and became then a source of, of ongoing strife, which is still not fully resolved. That's right. Among other issues that were happening. Among other issues, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so let's not get too far off track. So we've got this proposal here that, um, that we are saved by uh, allegiance and all of that that it entails. I take it, however, that there are some concerns that people might have. Uh, surely your critics have already hammered you on this. Some of them, I take it, you anticipated in your book. So, for example, uh, one of the questions would be, uh, well, if salvation is a gift of grace, uh, how how is it that, uh, you know, al- allegiance is a gift? Yeah, um, I did anticipate that question and did my best to um, to close off some of those concerns mm. with the, the best answer I felt like I could give. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that sometimes people have um, overly narrow views of grace that um, that don't reflect the ancient reality of gift giving mm. or a full understanding of gift giving. Okay, um, and in particular, I rely on John Barclay uh, and his uh, his fine book that's just come out. Um, his his book is called Paul and the Gift, mm. um, and Barclay uh, really does a, a masterful job of um, analyzing the concept of grace and showing that it was in fact multifaceted in antiquity, uh, and then uh, that its multifaceted dimensions, um, to more or less degree, were adopted uh, by the interpreters of Paul down through the, the ages. Uh, some picked up some aspects of his ideas of grace. Uh, some picked up others, some emphasized portions of grace that Paul didn't emphasize, uh, some heightened uh, dimensions of grace beyond anything that Paul ever did himself. Mm. Um, but uh, Barclay s- uh, splits out um, the concept of, of grace. And um, one of the things that's really helpful in so doing is that um, he shows, for instance, that the idea of the non-circularity of grace uh, is something that was not perfected in antiquity. And by that non-circularity, I mean 
the idea that if I give a gift to you, let's say I give you a really expensive watch, you know, there you go, Kurt, okay. you know, thank you very much. <laughs> um, you might actually feel obligated to give me something back. You're like, uh-huh. wow, you know, you're like, you know, Matt Bates is so generous. Yeah. You know, I've got to send him something. You wouldn't send me a watch, yeah. uh, but you might send me something back just, you know, because you feel like you're kind of obligated. Um, and if we feel that pressure today uh, of obligation to give back, uh, it was uh, quadruply so in antiquity. Um, there was an mm. e- enormous pressure. Your honor and your shame uh, culture, your honor was at stake mm-hmm. if you didn't reciprocate. Uh, and so that we don't know of any kind of gift giving in antiquity that didn't involve the need to reciprocate. Mm. So one of the misunderstandings of grace would be that, uh, especially as this moves into the Reformation and modern era, is that um, is there came to be an understanding or an interpretation of grace in Paul that suggested that if you get a gift, a gift has to, has to have no strings attached. That's the only kind of grace that matters. Um, Barclay shows that that idea um, has no uh, footing in the ancient world at all. Uh, no one around Paul believed that, nor did Paul believe that. Mm. Uh, and so that if you uh, accepted the Christ gift, then that doesn't mean that as part of accepting it that you weren't obligated to give something back. What are you obligated to give back? Your allegiance is what you're obligated to yeah, give back. Yeah. That's what I'm arguing. Uh, there's much more that could be said about grace. We've just hit the, the tip of the iceberg. Sure, yeah. So, and um, I mean, I think that it becomes clear that while Jesus loves us where we are at, he requires us to change, right? So I, I think here of the woman caught in adultery, uh, regardless, I know that passage isn't in the earliest manuscripts, but uh, I think from from that story, you know, what, what does he conclude? He says to the woman, go and sin no more. So he still has a re- requirement that um, y- you're right here with this gift giving. There's still this obligation. And I think a lot of us feel bad then. I mean, maybe because, you know, <laughs> I think we all still do it to this day. We ask for help from, uh, you know, our, our friends or family. Hey, can you help me with this house project? I need help with my electrical work. You know, and then all of a sudden you feel bad, so you want to help them in some other way instead of just being able to accept the gift. So what you're saying here is that in this culture, I mean, all the more so was this um, this reciprocal feeling uh, in, in existence. And so... Yeah, we might even go farther than that. We might even say that you you couldn't accept the gift without returning a gift. Oh, that there was no there was no way in which an acceptance could be predicated on a non circular gift. You had to give something back, uh-huh. uh, whether that was whether that was a, uh, just some public expression of gratitude. It didn't yeah. have to be a gift in kind. Yeah, um, but that uh, to not reciprocate would have been in fact a rejection of the gift. Wow, fascinating. So. What would th- then you say to people that say, well, God's love is unconditional? Well, um, we want to separate between unconditional and maybe unmerited. We wouldn't want to say that it's, it's unmerited. We don't, there's nothing we can do to deserve God's grace. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean uh, that it's unconditional. Um, I would say that the unconditional language is just flat out wrong. Um, I would say demonstrate to me from the scripture that it's unconditional. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and I think we need to think about what un- unconditional means, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, in the sense of non-circular is what I mean, uh, right. in the, in the way that we were talking about a, an exchange gift being demanded. And it, but it seems commonplace in evangelical churches to talk about the unconditional love of God. And that for you is a big, uh, folklore, it's folk myth. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we would maybe talk about God's unconditional love. That's not necessarily the same as his grace. Sure. Right? Um, yeah. But I think that what we need, what we do is we abstract grace too much. We don't think about, we think of it as like a concept, mm. right? I mean, mm-hmm. what is in view with grace is specifically the Christ gift. It's not, it's not a vague thing. Yeah. Uh, it's something that is given to, uh, it's a very specific act of grace that's given a specific gift. The Christ gift is given, and we can participate in that Christ gift um, by accepting it, and to accept it involves certain conditions of acceptance. Mm. Um, and uh, and so we would want to say that God's love is unconditional. Um, I think that he doesn't stop loving us. Um, but, yeah, we, I, we have to just be very careful in how we parse out uh, these different ideas, I think. Right, right. So that really seems, uh, at least for me, a, just a surprising feature that what you, what you've called the how did you phrase it the non circular or reciprocal gift um, yeah 
that I think it would be uh, foreign to a lot of uh, Americans today, even though we know what you're talking about because we've experienced that. But you're right. We've sort of abstracted this notion. And we think for Paul, it's just this, you know, um, un, un reciprocal idea. And that that is inaccurate as it pertains to Paul's thought. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that um, we can think of some other ways in which God's gift, um, you know, the, the concept of grace, like, for instance, the, the idea of, of God's grace being prior. One way we could talk about mm. perfecting grace might be to say that, well, a really good gift is one that comes before you even need it. Mm. Um, and, and Paul is going to argue the Christ gift is like that, that it does come before uh, we needed it. And in fact, it was something that God prepared in Christ for his church yeah. uh, before time even began. So it was something that God gave far prior. Mm. Um, how that connects to the individual is another matter, uh, as Paul may connect that more to groups uh, than to individuals. Mm. Um, but nevertheless, the idea of the priority of the gift would be something that we could talk about. Um, we could also just talk about um, you know, the gifts as effective gifts, like a really good gift maybe is one that actually does something helpful for you, <laughs> right? And if I give you a watch, right, like maybe you don't even wear a watch anymore because you have a cell phone, <laughs> yeah. right? And you, like you don't even like wearing jewelry. So I gave you an ineffective gift that does nothing for you. And everybody, right? everybody has someone in their life for whom they're obliged to give a gift, a Christmas gift. And you know the person's not going to do anything with yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a that's grace, but it's non effective grace, right? right. Paul, Paul's going to argue that uh, Paul's going to argue that the, the the grace of God is effective, right? That it achieves something for us, and yeah. so there can be confusion over this, and especially evangelical circles too, as people think, well, if it's if it's great, if it's grace, it's just a good gift and can focus on the unmerited nature of it, which is true, mm. but they don't realize that the God gives the gift for a purpose, right? Mm. That the gift is to be transformative and that grace rules over us now um, so that it's not a gift that isn't without um, an effect in our lives uh, that is going to be transformative. Mm -hmm. um, so um, before we head to a break here, I do want to cover this idea of gift as a priority, which you mentioned. So mm -hmm. I uh, know that for some people, they, there might be concern here that, well, it's really the the work of the the individual in being um, a uh, an allegiant supporter of Christ, and so how is it then that it's we recognize salvation is a uh, and God's grace is a gift of priority, and what does that mean? Yeah, the gift of priority then would be mainly the giving of Christ Himself. That's what the the Scripture would stress. Um, there's a, a lot of um, concern, especially within reform circles, about wanting to make sure that, like, well, even if we have faith, uh, then the faith itself is a gift uh, because everything comes from God. I mean, we would want to say probably on an ultimate level of systematic theology, it's probably true to say that, like, um, that God uh, is the one who gives us the free, uh, the, the gift to somehow or another to respond in grace with faith. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly not something that's emphasized in the same way that it's emphasized in certain, you know, dimensions of Reformed theology. Mm. Um, the priority uh, of the gift uh, is not focused on individual faith. Um, the priority is focused on Christ, right? Christ is the one who has come as the Christ gift and has been the faithful one for us. Um, and that's really the focus of the Christ gift. Uh, it doesn't focus so much on the gift of our personal faith um, mm. as if that's that's really what Paul really wants to teach is that God gave us that. Um, well, he might have um, probably did, sure. but, but it's not it's just not something the Bible spends much energy talking about. Um, the focus of, of attention is, isn't there. And uh, it's fascinating that you had that distinction in my own doctoral work. I've uh, dealt with this distinction between the history of salvation Christ as the gift in terms of the history of salvation or in the Latin historia salutis versus the individual's own salvation, which deals with the order of salvation or the ordo salutis. So this very distinction which you're making, I've also uh, been writing a little bit about in my, uh, mm -hmm. uh, my research on Vincent of Lorenz. Um, okay, well, good. Uh, we've got to take a break here, but when we come back, I want to explore, uh, you brought up you know, reform circles and whatnot. I want to talk more about uh, how this, uh, your proposal here, uh, how it jives with the Protestant Reformation and what that means for the doctrine of justification. So stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. 
You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Have you heard of the Google Ad Grant for nonprofits? 501c3 nonprofit organizations can receive $10,000 per month in online advertising credit from Google, empowering you to share your message with the world. At Defenders Media, we partnered with Nonprofit Megaphone, an agency focused solely on Google grant acquisition and management. They got us approved for the grant and now manage ad campaigns, bringing hundreds of new people to our websites each month. If you are eligible, Nonprofit Megaphone will acquire and manage the grant for you for a month for free to see if they can help you too. Visit nonprofitmegaphone.com to learn more. Hello, I'm David Smith, the Executive Director of Illinois Family Institute, a state-based Christian pro-life and pro-family public policy organization. I want to invite you to join us as we seek to be salt and light to a dark and rapidly decaying culture. You can do that in a number of ways. For example, you can join our email list to get timely alerts and great cultural commentaries. You can like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, listen to our podcasts, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can attend one or more of the special events and forums we host in different parts of the state. We do all these things to encourage and equip Christians in Illinois. You see, we need you to help us fulfill our mission to boldly bring a biblical perspective to public policy. Our faith requires us to be bold, speak truthfully, and love our neighbors. Join us. Visit IllinoisFamily.org to learn more. All right, well, thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. If you have enjoyed the first half of today's show, then I want to encourage you to uh, go to this website, thedefendersconference.com, because on November 3rd and 4th, Defenders Media is presenting uh, its annual conference in Bolingbrook, Illinois, and this year's theme is 500, the Protestant Reformation, where we will be discussing uh, themes and ideas associated with that uh, momentous event, uh, and we will be looking at some of the good things to come forth uh, from that era, but also constructively considering some of the shortcomings as well. And so the, we're bringing in a number of different uh, speakers uh, from across the country uh, to come in, Dr. Jerry Walls, Dr. Richard Park, Dr. James Payton, and a number of others. And we're going to be talking about issues uh, in Reformation theology. And also we will have uh, tracks on evangelism and apologetics. So it should be a great time. And I hope that you'll be able to join us in uh, two weeks again uh, if you want further information, you can go to thedefendersconference.com. So, uh, back to today's uh, discussion. I am here with Dr. Matthew Bates, and he is the author of Salvation by Allegiance Alone, which is uh, published by Baker Academic. And uh, if you're interested in uh, purchasing the book, we'll be sure to put a, a link uh, on the uh, on our website for this uh, episode. And uh, it's thus far been an intriguing discussion. In the first half, we were learning more about your proposal, uh, Matt, and uh, the the difficulties that come from a contemporary use of the word faith and how uh, as we place ourselves back in the New Testament cultural context, we can learn some things that we are missing due to our own cultural contexts. And it's really important to place ourselves if we were there. So the, the aspect of gift giving uh, ha, has some notions to it that are, in the literal use of the word, foreign uh, to us, foreign and and old, I guess you could also say, outdated, not in a bad way, just in a different way. Um, and so we want to try our best to understand what Paul means. Uh, now, 
uh, I'm sure, and as I have seen online, your proposal might be concerning to some, at least I'll say not to me, not yet, uh, <laughs> but help us to clarify some things. So uh, the Protestant Reformation, uh, which um, this year, you know, we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of that, uh, faith, uh, grace, faith, and works were key themes to that. Does it seem here that your proposal regarding allegiance would maybe um, do away or revise some of the work that the reformers did? Well, um, I think that it probably does force us to re-nuance um, the way in which the reformers articulated some of these things. I don't know that it would cause us to um, to do away with the five solas. Mm-hmm. I think, though, it's probably true that we have to be more precise about um, uh, the sola fide, the sola gratia, um, uh, the faith alone, the mm-hmm. grace alone, and what those actually mean. Now, we, we got into the grace alone a little bit last time um, and a little bit into the faith alone. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that what happened, uh, at least this would be my rough analysis, is that in the in the Reformation era, um, both on the Catholic and the Protestant end, um, there were certain ideas about what um, what the gospel is. And especially as Luther um, so stridently put forward his gospel of justification by faith and sort of argued that this is the doctrine by which the church stands or falls and fronted justification by faith as the gospel, um, that became the terms of the debate uh, that was accepted um, within Roman Catholic circles as being a definitive discussion about salvation. Well, I think what what didn't happen is that, um, that the precision around the gospel, um, there was some lack there. Um, justification by faith was made to be equivalent to the gospel, Sometimes Luther says that. Sometimes he actually gets something closer to what I would regard to be um, a proper articulation of the biblical gospel. Mm. But but he doesn't very often. More often he centers around justification by faith as the gospel. The problem with that is that neither one are the gospel. Um, mm. I would argue that faith is actually the means uh, uh, to the gospel or the way in which we respond to the gospel. It's not the gospel itself, um, but it's actually our appropriate response to the gospel um, mm. that we— we give our loyalty to Jesus, the King, who's proclaimed as part of the gospel. And meanwhile, justification is not part of the gospel either, except in as much as it is, uh, it does pertain to Jesus's justification. Um, but when the Bible talks about the gospel and defines the gospel, it actually doesn't include justification or doesn't include our justification clearly within it. Mm. it I'll talk about uh, Jesus's death for sins. Uh, his burial, his resurrection on the third day. Mm-hmm. I would I would argue that actually the resurrection um, portion of that um, entails the idea of justification, but it's Jesus's own justification, um, and that's what's being discussed there. So we talk about Jesus as being declared the righteous one uh, as part of uh, his resurrection. Uh, that was a vindication of his actions, so that he was declared to be the righteous one uh, by God through mm. that activity of raising him, um, and then how then we connect to that, you know, as part of the Ordo Salutis. Mm. So, for some very strong, devout Protestants, justification is a uh, an imputed righteousness uh, for the sinner. Does your proposal here have any objection to that? Uh, and uh, if if not. If you accept that proposition, I know we're getting a little technical here. H- how would you nuance that idea? Yeah, a great question. Um, yeah, so the traditional idea um, within most Reformed and Lutheran circles about righteousness is, as, as you, you say, it's imputed. Um, and the image that's often been associated with this is the idea of a garment covering over your filth. Right. That Jesus's righteousness is like, you know, the shiny white sheet or whatever it might be um, that then is imputed to you. So it's applied to you uh, and then it covers over your sin so that you are simultaneously just and a sinner. Mm. God, the father, looks upon you. And what does he see? He sees Jesus's righteousness, uh, which acts as sort of a shield over you. uh, And then he doesn't actually see your filth uh, so that you then are simultaneously just and a sinner. Um, 
I, I do think that there are some limitations to that idea, especially the idea of it covering of, over us like a garment or the idea that that language is associated with imputation. Mm-hmm. I think that's actually to mix metaphors. Paul does talk about us being clothed with Christ uh, and uses that language, but not specifically with his righteousness. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's sort of been a mixing of metaphors to try to um, uh, to, to describe this idea of, of an active imputation of Christ's obedience to us. Um it's just it, what 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 has happened is it's sort of a, it gets a little bit loose with the Bible's own metaphors and language. Um, the, the Bible does talk about um, reckoning or calculating righteousness to us, um, and so that um, that that could be a, a way that's more of a bookkeeping metaphor uh, right. that um, right. that there's a credit into our account of righteousness. Um, so I, I do think these metaphors, um, especially the idea of a calculating uh, of righteousness to us. Uh, they do work uh, within a model of imputation, but only if that's understood to first involve union, um, and that union with Christ is more primal. Mm. So that um, that if we're going to talk about imputation, um, we need to we need to contextualize that first within a broader framework of union with Christ, and only then can we make sense of imputation. So we might be able to give it um, a, a small uh, piece of the pie as uh, as part of a valid way of describing. Uh, how it is we connect with the righteousness of God, but we can't. Uh, it, 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 we, we, if we don't qualify it, we're at some risk of departing from the Bible's own way of speaking about these things. Mm. Fascinating. So, you um, you said there that the the when Jesus was resurrected, that and, and maybe I misheard you, or, or correct me if I'm mistaken. You said that at that point Jesus was declared righteous. Tell, tell me more about that idea and that notion. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the idea behind um, justification language or righteousness language, stikai uh, sune is righteousness in the Greek, or tikaiao is the verb. Um, yeah, scholarly studies have suggested that this means to declare righteous. Uh, this was a fight in the Reformation era about whether it means to make righteous or to declare righteous. Uh, the linguistic evidence has clearly supported the idea that it's a declaration of righteousness. Um what, it, what has happened, though, is I think there's been a, a desire, especially within some wings of the Reformation, to restrict that idea um, to a declaration without allowing any room for any kind of actual transformation in the, uh, uh, in the person who's received the declaration. Mm-hmm. And I think that that um, – that's I don't think that's very uh, easily sustained. Um, an example of this would be in Romans 6, I believe it's verse 7, I'd have to look it up and on my scripture in front of me, um, where it talks about us having been uh, justified from, uh, from sin. Um, and so this language here of having been justified from sin in context, sin is being personified as a, as a power or a force, uh, and it's quite clear this involves the idea of liberation from sin. Mm. This is not just a declaration of innocence, uh, but this is actually a liberation from sin's power. So we might think of this in terms of, um, to kind of get philosophical on you, in terms of what um, philosophers call performative utterances. Um, uh, This goes back to um, John Austin and others who are part of the Oxford um, philosophical uh, school um, that stress ordinary language. Um, Anyway, as part of this performative utterance, one of the things that was pointed out is that words don't just mean things, they can do things. So if I'm a judge and I'm a legal judge and I say to you, not guilty, right? Well, my words have a certain locution, a certain meaning as an utterance, mm-hmm. right? Um, you could analyze what the word guilty means and not, and you could think through that. But it also does something. It it, it actually caused your situation to change. If yeah. I'm a legal judge, you actually were declared innocent at that moment. And you had certain privileges and rights that were conferred on you through the utterance. Um, and so we might want to think about uh, the declarative activity of God as being like that. When uh, God declares Jesus to be just uh, and declares us to be just in him, that that declaration has to go beyond um, uh, just a bare statement to doing something. Uh, there's also what we would call the prolocutive effect as well, like that there's a result that um, that comes out of the uh, the statement, uh, the attendant context of the statement, and the effect are all part of the utterance itself. Mm. Uh, and uh, so we would want to see there's some liberation that happens, right, when, uh, through justification language. So uh, here you're you're um, uh, basically proposing name it and claim it, right? If I see a Ferrari, then I can 
<laughs> uh, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, yes. Name no. claim whatever you want, Kurt. We'll see if you get it. <laughs> no, of course, there's the fine distinction here between uh, persons having certain authority uh, to declare certain things. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, right. If you're a, if you're a pseudo judge, it doesn't work if you declare somebody to be innocent. Right? You, have <laughs> right. to be, uh, you actually have to be a real judge. Uh, Darn. Know, so, uh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because I've been wanting that uh, that Chrysler uh, uh, Pacifica, that new hybrid minivan. Because oh. we, we're starting to grow out of our micro van. We've got a Mazda five at uh, uh, home. So yeah, well, I just grew out of our minivan. Our family has the seventh on the way, and we're oh wow, out of, we're out of minivan land, and we're in a real hog van land. Yeah, now. big we van. The, we got the church bus going on. <laughs> you know, the, the twelve passenger Ford Transit. We in fact just got it registered yesterday, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we had to get a special plate, like a D plate. Is that like, right? Pay extra money. Yeah. They're like, this, this vehicle weighs so much. You have to have like this more expensive <laughs> plate. And we're like, great. Oh, well, don't come to the toll roads here in Chicagoland. Cause they might charge you more for, if you got another axle or <laughs> another extra axle on there. I mean, so uh, if you haven't seen a Ford transit yet, start looking around, you'll see them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're kind of this big newer style looking van. Okay. Nice. All right. So, um, here with your proposal, um, uh, there is, uh, again, concern. And I bring up concern just because I've seen some of the articles people have written, even some of the interviews uh, that you've done. Uh, you've had some people accuse you of holding to a Catholic view. Um, could you explain uh, what that means, where they're coming from when they say that, and, and uh, how they are mistaken? Sure. Yeah, I, th- I think the best way to explain the reactions to my book has been there's been a palpable nervousness in some quarters. <laughs> um, the, there, there hasn't really been any, you know, accusations of heresy or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but especially you those, mean not uh, yet, not yet. Not there yet. Has- <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I think especially in reformed quarters, there's been um, some nervousness because I, th- I think their their system is very um, defined and fine tuned, and um, mm-hmm. some of the issues I'm pressing on here. Um, you know, uh, would force them perhaps to uh, reconsider how they're defining grace, uh, how they're defining faith. Mm. And if you start fiddling around with those, it can yeah. affect the whole system. Right. And uh, we've talked about that enough to give you a sense of where some of that nervousness is coming from. But um, beyond that, um, there's some nervousness around uh, the ways in which this might disrupt the Ordo Salutis. Um, mm-hmm. As the Ordo Salutis is something that's sort of cherished in Reformed theology, uh, and it's understood that there's a sort of a progression of regarding the individual, that God elected certain individuals before time began, uh, and then he brings them through a process. And as part of this, God and God alone can act. This is what they call monergism, mm-hmm. that, that there can be no synergistic interplay between you know the individual who has free will and God, uh, but a strict monergism, meaning God and God alone can act in any uh, in any and every portion of salvation, or else then we would have a boast. Mm. So there's fear around all that and uh, around defending the monergistic vision. Mm-hmm. So as part of then uh, the Ordo Salutis, you have election, uh, and then eventually uh, through various steps, uh, you're probably going to have a statement of regeneration within Reformed theology that you didn't do it, uh, but at some moment God like zapped you and regenerated you, and then he gave you the necessary capacity for faith mm-hmm. so that you can then could respond to the saving message uh, and then and then you 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 invested your faith in Jesus and then you can be said to be justified uh, and then once you're justified well then you're going to be sanctified and then you're going to proceed to glorification mm-hmm. um, one of the things I'm arguing in the book is that this is a misunderstanding of the uh, this this construction of the order salutis misunderstands um, the order salutis in general and justification in particular. Um, I point out that um, these statements of election um, are election in the sun uh, and that are corporate statements made to the church. Uh, And so that whenever we understand this uh, idea of God's choosing before time, this choosing is specifically in the sun and this choosing is specifically the church. Mm. uh, And uh, that if if it is individuated uh, down to the, uh, the individual level, that's not clear. Uh, that's something that would have to be argued, and I do not think has been successfully argued. Yeah, I think there are a number of studies that have argued in the other direction, um, and more successfully argued. So I, I speak of maybe of, um, of Chad Thornhill's book. Uh, I think it's called The New Chosen People uh, that just recently argued this, for okay. instance. Well, so um, and um, we've talked about election on the show before, and I am a, a corporate election advocate. So it okay. sounds like your proposal here is very compatible with with my view on election. Uh, it would be, and, probably. And I formulated my view 
um, simply from reading the text. Uh, so, for example, Ephesians 1 is corporate language. We, yes. us, our, uh, you also believed. Uh, now, I'm not sure what your specific view on, on, on whether the us is Jewish Christians or the Christian church, but, but regardless, yeah, I, I, you know, very sympathetic to the corporate view. Um, and I very much like how you phrased whether it's individuated that hasn't been successfully shown. And when people make yeah. that step, they, they think what's true of the whole is true of each part of the whole. They're making a logically fallacious jump when there is no further evidence to support their position. Um, so yeah, sounds like we're we're going to be pretty uh, on par on that specific point. So yeah, that sounds that sounds probably true. Um, so then, so as part of that, you know, the corporate election is making some people nervous. Um, and then beyond that, like I argue that justification um, and sanctification are not distinguished in our text mm. uh, in the way that the Reformed tradition would like to distinguish them. Mm -hmm. um, that so they're they're not actually separate stages in the Ordo Salutis. Um, that actually is a distinction that goes back to Calvin. Mm. That I don't think can be uh, uh, that you can't really get to through a fair uh, exegesis of Scripture, uh, and then beyond that, the language of glorification isn't future; it's past, present, and future, uh, just like justification is. So mm. that it's not a, a, a linear progression that the individual is being brought through, but rather these are statements of, about the fundamental identity of the people of God, that we are justified, that we are sanctified, that we are glorified, past, present, and future, mm. um, and so. This sort of flattening out of, of uh, justification and moving it from a stage then uh, in the order the, a person's order of salvation to instead helping it to see that it's language um, uh, that marks off the people of God as the saved people of God, the justified people of God in Christ, uh, only in Christ, um, so that they can be said to be justified uh, if they're in Christ, uh, so that this language then of the righteousness of God is specifically union language mm. uh, and, uh, and language that connects to their justification is contingent on, on union language. So, and, and now I'm unfamiliar with Catholic theology on this. So is your proposal there taking a few ideas from that tradition on justification then? Well, no, not really. It's actually quite different on justification. Um, there is some overlap. Um, sure. Catholic ideas of justification favor two metaphors. Um, the metaphor would be uh, the two metaphors would be um, impartation and infusion, and they're, right, they're different right. metaphors, and they're sometimes mixed. Um, but within Catholic theology, specifically at the Council of Trent, the idea is that justification is something that you're given at baptism. So when you're baptized, uh, you are said to be justified. Uh, and that uh, this is a gift that's given by grace, so you didn't do anything to earn it. Um, and uh, and then once you're given that, it's your job to nurture it because it's been imparted. Mm. God's righteousness has been imparted to you, and so the impartation metaphor involves separation. So it's no longer Christ's righteousness. It was uh, the righteousness of God or the righteousness of—it of, of, was Christ's benefit for you mm -hmm. uh, that was then applied to you and that made you righteous. Uh, and then once you got it, Right. You're responsible to keep it. How do you keep it? Um, well, you keep it through the sacramental system within Catholic theology. Right. Um, as if you commit a mortal sin, then you need to um, to undertake penance. Uh, and uh, and in undertaking penance, then um, those sins are wiped away again so that your righteousness is restored. Mm. So you have to kind of grow it and nurture it. Um, mm. So this would obviously be contradictory to Reformed uh, uh, Lutheran, Reformed theology, everything coming out of the Protestant Reformation, which would say, no, it's Christ's righteousness alone and that we share it. Uh, it never becomes our own independently. And that's the key point of difference would be mm. that Catholics argue it becomes our own independently. Now, I think within the boundaries of that, I do think that some Protestants have favored imputation language and ignored infusion language. Mm. Uh, infusion is a very different metaphor as it's an organic metaphor of, a, of liquid, uh, of liquid moving from one place to another, right? That's, uh, the metaphor of infusion. Mm. Um, so you think of a sponge getting soaked at a corner, right? And the, the liquid coming to move from the wet spots over to the dry spots gradually, that's an infusion metaphor. Mm. So it, once we're in union with Christ, right? Um, at that moment of union, uh, then we would think of his righteousness uh, being infused to us so that we fully possess it uh, would be the idea. We don't 
uh, we don't increase in it. We don't um, we don't need any more of it for our salvation or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, all the necessary benefits are there as they've been infused over to us. Uh, so I think it's an acceptable metaphor um, that sometimes Protestants uh, have ignored that they could benefit from because it fronts union. Mm. And so this would have implications for uh, Christian ethics and application that uh, we really can be free from sin. Um, Tell me more about how that would go about. Yeah, so uh, some of the, yeah, the implications of this then would be that when we're in Christ, yeah, that we um, are in union with him and so that we're united to his life, his death, his resurrection, uh, and his the important point, I think, then in terms of the ongoing Christian ethic that you mentioned would be that, that uh, you know, that whenever we are united with Christ in, in baptism and faith, right, then we're buried with him, as it says in Romans 6, 1 through 4, and that we've died to sin. The rest of Romans 6 is really about that, right? Um, and that we also, at the same time, have the life of God that's beginning to work in our bodies. It's actually in our embodiment that the life of God is active, hmm. uh, and so that we can think of the resurrection power already at work in us. So we want to say that there's still sin lodged in our flesh in some way. This is what Paul really talks about in Romans 7, yeah. right? Uh, but nevertheless, like as we participate in the Spirit, um, we have died to that sin uh, in Christ, right? And that uh, the resurrection power is at work even in our embodied actions, so that our faith, which I wouldn't see as a disembodied thing, it's not just something that happens with our minds, uh, but is actually it's our allegiance to Christ, which involves you know both mental ideas, uh, a confession of faith in Jesus, but also the embodied loyalty to him. Mm. Uh, well, why is the embodied loyalty possible? Well, partly because uh, the embodied loyalty or the allegiance, right, is uh, is something that's empowered by the Spirit, as the Spirit uh, is something that uh, cooperates alongside of us as 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 we um, as we walk with the Lord. Mm. So, final question then: What does it look like to practice allegiance? Yeah, this is a this is a great question, and because I think it's the question that really brings out <laughs> why does this matter at the end of the day? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, we can be all abstract and theoretical, but at, at the end of the day, I think. Um, the, the the quickest payoff for this uh, would be more accurate evangelism. Mm. Uh, you know, I think that's that's essential that we um, if we understand that to to put faith in Jesus is not just to believe that Jesus died for my sins uh, and not just to believe he's the Lord. Right. But actually to commit ourselves to him, if it involves this this clear understanding that I'm giving my loyalty to the king, who's the king who died for my sins, who was raised, you know, and uh, and justified, uh, and that I now participate in his life, death, his resurrection, and all of that with the hope of future uh, resurrection life. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it, it, that changes how we do our evangelism, I think. The second thing I would say is it, it also helps us to, I think, overcome some traditional dichotomies that have plagued the church. Uh, I would say specifically the dichotomy between discipleship and evangelism, that our models in the church have tended to be like, well, we need to get people saved. We need to preach the gospel message and get them saved, mm-hmm. which we absolutely do need to preach the gospel message. And people do need to, uh, for what, if, if this is the term we want to use, they need to get saved. Um, <laughs> but um, but this is understood to be something separate from discipleship. Like first we get them saved and then we like plug them into a discipleship program and so they can grow, mm. right? That's the, that's the typical model for how churches think about um, the relationship between evangelism and discipleship. Right. I think what my book shows is that is that that kind of division is completely unsustainable. Uh, the only kind of evangelism that is worthwhile is one that invites you to be a disciple, that Jesus is the Lord and the King, and that part of what it means to get saved in the first place means you're committing yourself to a program of discipleship. Mm. And, and on the other hand, that uh, discipleship isn't, isn't optional to salvation, right? That if you don't persevere as a disciple, you will not, you will not reach eternal life. Uh, you're on the road to it, uh, and uh, you have the eternal life working in you right now. Um, but uh, perseverance is required uh, in order for the allegiant outworking of our salvation. Wow. That's uh, definitely, I think, a powerful um, application uh, to your proposal here that uh, that I think you're right. We The church has divided these aspects, um, and, and it's left people— uh, and, and, you know, one of the downsides to it is it's left people thinking that they're saved when they're not. 
you know, oh yeah, I once said a prayer doing this yep. and I go to church on Christmas and Easter. And so maybe that's worse than having them not have said the prayer at all because they think everything is fine when it's not. Yes. Um, so that's, that's a great application. Well, uh, Dr. Matthew Bates, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. And uh, if you want to check out his book, we'll put a link at the website. Again, the book is Salvation by Allegiance Alone, Rethinking Faith, Works, and the Gospel of Jesus the King. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks so much, Kurt. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Well, that does it for today's show. I am uh, grateful for the continued support of our patrons and partnerships that we have with our sponsors, uh, Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, The Illinois Family Institute, Evolution 2.0, Fox Restoration, and Nonprofit Megaphone. Uh, Again, if you are interested in hearing uh, more topics such as this, I want to encourage you to go to the defendersconference.com website. Check that out, and I'd love to see you on November 3rd and 4th in Bolingbrook, Illinois, at the the Compass Church, Bolingbrook Campus, uh, where the event will be uh, hosted. And it would be, it's going to be just a really fun time uh, for us to learn more about the Reformation themes and ideas uh, from that period. Um, Well, I want to uh, thank our guest today, Dr. Matthew Bates, for uh, enlightening us on his uh, perspective on pistis, uh, what faith really is, what it's about, and maybe how we ought to use a different word in today's uh, common parlance uh, to refer to those biblical ideas. And uh, finally, I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.